This subject on the Holy Spirit is uh, giving you a chance to think about some things you haven't thought about before. It's not so much what I say as it is that you are taught by the Holy Spirit and he certainly is in this room and in you and uh, maybe I'll stimulate you to let him work on you a certain way that this will be important to you and that you'll learn from it. If the Holy Spirit has been sent to us to teach us Christ, then uh, there are certain scriptures that we need an answer to. For instance, Acts 1 and 8 is the most popular scripture used for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. For this verse says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Amen. Now this verse of scripture really says from our viewpoint what it ought to say. I wish it said it clearer so that every viewpoint could have gotten it. But the verse of scripture generally is used to say that when the Holy Spirit has come, the believer will have power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now I make a strong emphasis on the word after. It didn't say, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. If it had said that, then it would have been the true answer to the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But instead it says, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. We have analyzed that, and the word after is what is intended in the Greek, and not when the Holy Spirit is come upon you. Therefore, I place a great stress on the word after because that means a period of time goes by from when the Holy Spirit comes as to when power comes. This is not to say that the baptism of the Holy Spirit does not empower the believer, for certainly it does, but we must take some of the emphasis off of the believer receiving power to the power being the revelation of Christ that is in us. Revelation knowledge, I feel, puts a stronger emphasis on the word after than even the Holy Spirit coming upon us places on us. Then what is the power that comes upon us? What is the power that we receive when the Holy Spirit comes upon us? What is the power? What what is in revelation knowledge that is power. Through the years, I have had this thought to grow and grow and grow in me to where I see now that a person filled with the Holy Spirit is going to be a Christ person in action. That the filling of the Holy Spirit is the bringing forth of Christ through the natural man in a powerful way. And the more you are filled with the Spirit, the more Christ emphasis will be in your life. What is really in this power? Well, there are at least uh, six or seven things that I want to talk to you about that are very foundational and perhaps elementary, but these things are things that we are giving a new understanding to. What is the real power of the Holy Spirit? What is it that is in his power that comes upon the believer? These are some of the things. The first thing that the Holy Spirit emphasizes to the believer is the fact that God is able to keep that believer in his plan. In fact, the Holy Spirit's power is revealing constantly to the believer that he is a child of God, the Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The key word to this is the word able. And I'm going to ask you to mark something in your Bible so that you will remember uh, this session because the word able is a word that the Holy Spirit has used and is translated as the word able to show that God's power in the believer is able to keep the believer. 
Now, you have always thought that it is you doing something, an outer thing, which keeps you right with God. But I want to show you that in the power of the Holy Spirit is the keeping power of God. The Holy Spirit in your soul mind constantly making you aware of who and what you are shows that God is able to keep you. Look at John 10 and 29. John 10 and 29. A popular verse, you probably know it. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able, circle the word able, no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Now he's talking here about the sheep. Beginning at verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able. The word able is the word that shows the keeping power of God in the believer's life. Go with me to Romans 8. In chapter 8 of Romans, the powerful new creation life chapter, at verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing is able. It is the Holy Spirit's work in his power to show us that nothing is able to separate us from this Christ that is in us. We're going to have temporary separation, but there's not be a breakup of the marriage. You're going to have temporary separation as wife believers from Christ's husband but we'll always be drawn back because that's the power of the Holy Spirit to do that drawing. Look at Romans 14, chapter 14, verse 4. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or faileth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. A power in the word able. Look at Ephesians 3 and 20. Now unto him that is able, unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Now this is a all-consuming verse on this subject. The power that works in us is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power that works in us. How does he work in us? By causing us to see and to know that God is able to do abundant above all we ask or think. Notice the verses preceding this 20th verse where he's praying a prayer here. Back to verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able. Here's another able. That you may be able. Christ dwelling in you makes it possible for you to be able to do what? To have great power to heal the sick and cast out devils? No. What does it say? 
It's a mind thing. It's a soul mind thing. Might be able to do what? Comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Now you see our tendency when we think we're able to do something is to turn immediately to do an outer thing. This is where Paul is different from all other writers. Instead of him saying, now you've got the power of the Holy Ghost working in you so you can go out and do great exploits for God. That's never in his thinking. Nowhere in his writing is that in his thinking. His, his thinking was that you are able now to comprehend. You know something. This verifies the fact that our knowing is what it is that produces the Christ that is in us. As we come to the knowing of this Christ, learning of this Christ, we fall in love with this Christ that is in us, then we have comprehended where our power is. We have comprehended where our real power is. Now, I have this happen to me every once in a while in very simple things outside of this, uh, the spiritual realm that I'm usually in in these meetings. I do a whole lot of messing around with machinery and equipment in our printing plant. And I'm not a machinist, a mechanic. I'm not mechanically minded at all. But I'm left to have to wrestle with these machines when something breaks down. And I tell you what I've learned. I tell the father when I start up a machine that, Father, this is a Christ son doing this. It really isn't me. It's Christ going to run this machine. And even though Christ is running this machine in my comprehension, it still breaks down. So I'm glad to know that Christ has trouble with those machines too. But what happens is that when the breakdown comes, the Christ son says, Father, you must help us. And I've had it to happen time and time again, not knowing a thing about why that machine broke down to fiddle around, hit something, bang it, or twist something, and that machine start working again. I've had that to happen so many times that it's absolutely incredible. So God didn't reach down and fix it, but I was able to comprehend that, that Christ in me was doing that operation and God the Father would allow him to find an answer for it. Now that's how the Christian life should operate simply. So the prayer was that we may comprehend with all saints. And then notice verse 19. Verse 19 says, and to know didn't say feel, didn't say experience, but says to know the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, which is greater than anything you know in the secular realm, that you may be filled with all the goodness of God. So the enablement of the Holy Spirit is to bring us to a knowing. Now that really confuses and upsets people because they think when I get on the word knowing in the Greek exegnosis, that when I start talking about gnosis and I'm talking about intellectualism and high-powered uh, wisdom and so forth, I'm not. The way God operates in the area of gnosis or knowledge is that he gives you knowledge to be who you are on the level of what you know and understand. See, only God can do that. I have to stereotype all of you and put you all in the same box and try to get you all doing the same thing, which may not fit all of you. But God is able to deal with every one of us on the basis of what we know and understand about him. So this, this verse says that uh, we can know the love of Christ, which goes beyond all secular knowledge, that you can know and experience God on your level of understanding. Think about that now, because oftentimes we sit and and as particularly in law, I would, uh, under my law teaching, I would say to people, now you've got to get this down, folks. You've got to memorize this. You've got to put this to work. You've got to make these seven steps work. And, uh, you know, everybody diligently would do it because all we knew was law, but it didn't fit everybody. They couldn't do that thing. But God knows what your understanding is on any subject, and the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit that is in you, is able to deal with you on that level of understanding so that every one of us will be growing by the work of the Holy Spirit and not by my leading. My leading can only stereotype you and bring you to what it is I know and what I understand. I, in fact, see the day, I already see it. We've got, we've got uh, uh, people who have come up in this message that are seeing things I never dreamt of before. And that's beautiful. 
because that's their level of understanding and God works for them on that level and I respect that. Somebody come to me and say, well, that fellow's saying it entirely different. I said, let him say it. See, he may come up with something we've never seen or heard because the Holy Spirit is the teacher here who is enabling us to be what it was God intended us to be. Go with me to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3, and we want verse 21. Who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working wherewith, whereby he is able. There it is again. According to the working whereby he is able, even to subdue all things unto himself. Now, if you want to know what the Holy Spirit wants to teach you, he wants to teach you how God is able to do this. Now, remember, the land of rest is God doing it, not you. You say, well, I do nothing, then I'll sit by as a pacifist and just let it happen. No, you'll do more than ever before in Canaan's land. You'll be running around walls and, and breaking uh, vases and, and uh, screaming and hollering the victory, but it'll be him doing the work. You'll just be reacting to what it is he's asked you to do. He is enabling you by the work of the Holy Spirit to know that all things are in his trust and care. Once you see Christ as your life, you don't ever need to worry again about being able to make it. That'll kill your testimony that you're going to hold out to the end. Pray that I'll hold out to the end. That's killed right off. You've got to get a new testimony now. Your testimony needs to be, I rejoice that I got it made in Christ Jesus. Don't ever say, I got it made. Just say, I got it made in Christ Jesus. Go with me to 2 Timothy 1. Second Timothy 1, and I want uh, verse 12, I believe. Second Timothy 1 and 12. And I think... Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me. Here you are, another able. Who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Now that's a different kind of verse, you see. It's Paul saying to Timothy that I thank the Lord who has enabled me. It's the word able we want to see. Who does the ablement? Who is in charge of the enablement in your life? That's the power of the Holy Spirit revealing to you that you are able by the Christ that is in you to do all things. Let's look at Hebrews 2 and 18. Hebrews 2 and 18. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor, to love, and take care of them that are tempted. He is able. Now, if the Holy Spirit was going to teach you something, what would he teach you in your darkest moment? Let's say you're tempted to sin. The Holy Spirit would come to you and say, you are not able to withstand this, but he is. What is he doing? He's saying the real you is Christ, and the real you can withstand this because Christ is able to withstand this temptation. That's the message of the Holy Spirit. That's where the power of the Holy Spirit is in the keeping power. Look at the Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. This verse says, Wherefore he is able also. Here's your next able. He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Now, when I was in uh, college, one teacher said to me that this 25th verse of Hebrews 7 is the most powerful verse in the whole Bible. He broke it down into different divisions, saying first, wherefore he is able. He said, you could stop right there, but the power is compounded. 
also to save them to the uttermost. But he says the power is compounded there that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He says it's the strongest compounded verse in the Bible. That was his viewpoint. But what we see here is that God has been able to save us to the uttermost. Now, where would be the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? It would be to destroy the doubt and the fear that you have been saved to the uttermost. I think every believer at some time goes through a period where he wonders, am I really saved? I got no feeling. I got nothing that uh, verifies it right now. Am I really saved? Am I really what I ought to be? Am I really born again? And so there the power of the Holy Spirit comes in to show you that God was able to save you to the uttermost. Now that's the strongest word. Uttermost is the strongest word you can use for darkness or hell or righteousness or salvation. To the uttermost. Strongest Greek word there is showing the far outedness of God's ability. So what, where would be the power of the Holy Spirit? to tell you in that moment, bring to your mind the fact that God has been able to save you to the uttermost. So don't look at these outer things. Don't go by your feelings, your temptations, your doubts, your fears. You have been saved to the uttermost. See, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what gets you up and keeps you going and keeps you trusting and gives you victory. Well, let's look at one more. Over to Jude. You know about Jude? He, he's way over there by the book of Revelation now. Jude, verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forever. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Well, these are hard scriptures for we who have been brought up under the law. We've never really given the Holy Spirit that right. We've given the Holy Spirit the right to deal with us in an outer form. Saying, Holy Spirit, don't let me do this. Don't let me go to that place. Uh, a fellow said to me the other day, he said, if God don't want me to do this thing I'm about to do, he's about to get messed up in a cult. And he, he said, if God don't want me to do this thing, the Holy Spirit will stop me. That's the way we think. So I, I didn't hear him say that or I would have slapped. I kindly rebuke that idea because the, the Holy Spirit's work is not to stop us in an outer way. That's the way we, we've always used him. The Holy Spirit's ministry and the work is to change our minds and renew our minds and to bring our minds under subjection to God's will. And as a result of doing so, we will be able to overcome all things because Christ in us is our life, our strength, our energy. And we can do all things. Well, these are ten times in the scriptures that the word able is used. That's a compounding of scriptures. That's a heavy weight of scriptures showing the enablement of God working in the believer. How does that work? By the power of the Holy Spirit. But let's move on. The Holy Spirit brings power to the believer in the issue of love. The loving power of God is a part of that power that comes to us after that the Holy Ghost has come upon us. I want you to turn to the 13th chapter of John. John chapter 13. Begins reading in verse 1 of John 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that the hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world. He loved them unto the end. Now, if the Holy Spirit was really going to do something for me in a powerful way, 
he could do nothing greater or better than to renew my mind to the fact that Jesus will love me to the very end. What's one of the first signs of the law? It is God won't love you if you don't do this. You don't want God to hate you, do you? God hates you, he'll send you to hell. What is it the Holy Spirit's power working in our life will do? He'll show us this very thing, the power of God's love. The ultimate power of God's love is that he would love his own, which are in the world, uh, unto the very end. There are three things said in this verse. That is, first, you must be his own. You must be his. You're not his, of course, these benefits don't belong to you. You're not in the family. But those that are his and are in the world, you see, that's interesting that it's put like this because that's where we are. We're in this world. We're in this world. We're in the world every day. You, in fact, in a sense, are at the end of the world. That My mind was struck by what we used to argue in foreign missions about where the world was. And there are two concepts of the world. To some, the world is a geographical area. And to others, the world is a classification of people. Well, it's really both of those things. But the way I see it is that many of you go into all the world, even on your job because you have there the classification of worldly people, even on the job, and some of them are really far out. So while you're not geographically at the end of the world, you're in the world. And that's where your witness counts. But that's not what this verse is talking about, but it comes to me when he says that we are in the world. Where are you in the world? You're, you're at, the, at, at the doorstep of the world every time you turn around, whether you go to the grocery store or filling station or on the job, you're in the world. And he said, that's where God will love you. Isn't that wonderful? That's where he'll love you. And there was an issue that came up in the Lord's Prayer. I think we might touch on that if we get far enough along here. But that issue was when Jesus said to the Father, praying about those that were his, that he was giving them back to the Father. And he said, Father, I don't ask that you take them out of this world. Leave them right here in the world. I'm not asking them to have a soft spot that once they get saved, they're taken out of this world. Leave them in the world because your power is able to keep them right where they are. And so he said, I'm not going to pray even for the world at that point. I don't pray for the world to get saved. I pray for those whom thou hast given me that they may be one with me as I'm one with you. That was a large prayer. <laughs> so he says here, uh, I've loved them even though they're in the world and I love them to the very end. Now, that's a wonderful thing. In my lifetime, I've seen a few believers who passed on at their dying moment who didn't sense that, that God loved them to the very end. And I think this is some of the most despondent times I ever had in the ministry, to think that they'd heard all the sermons and been in all the meetings and got down to the last moment and wondered if God loved them. Yeah. How greater power could there be in the Holy Spirit than to renew our minds? Because you see, the love of God was there. They didn't receive it. They didn't understand it. They didn't know about it. What was missing? The power of the Holy Spirit. Where is his power? Revealing to them that God loves them to the very end. You understand that? He'll love you to the very end. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans 5. Romans chapter 5. at uh, verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> now, I never read this verse, but what I don't think of my ignorance. For many years, I preached a sermon as an evangelist 
that included this eighth verse, Romans 5 and 8. And you know how I read that for years? God commandeth his love toward us. And every once in a while I'd hear another preacher who would read it the same way. God commanded his love toward us. But you know what's wrong with that? That's error. You can't command love. You could commend it. But you can't command it. That was my ignorance. God commendeth his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, why would I include this verse as a part of the power of the Holy Spirit working in our mind? Because after the Holy Spirit has begun to deal with you over a period of time, this is what's going to happen. He's going to contrast to you your present dilemma with your past. For instance, in your present dilemma, you'll think, well, here I'm needing a miracle, I'm needing a healing, I'm needing something from God, and it looks like God doesn't love me. But the power of the Holy Spirit in your mind will say, God not only loves you now, <coughs> he loved you when you were a sinner, did he not? When you were bound for hell, when you were no count and no good, what was it that saved you in the first place? What was it that brought you to God? It was the love of God, and while you were yet sinners, God loved you, and Christ died for your sins. So you're surely not worse now than you were then. You're his child, and if he loved the sinner, he surely loves you. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in renewing our minds. What are we doing? We're talking about getting this mind out of the pollution that it's been in all of this time and getting it to think properly. That's where the Holy Spirit works. That's where his power is, is getting us to think properly, to work properly. So you have the power of God in loving. <clears throat> but then we also have the power of God in prayer. And I think this would be a good point to turn to John 17. I want to talk to you a little bit out of John 17, the Lord's Prayer. Would you believe that the Christ that is in you would still have the same attitude and knowledge working of the Christ that was in Jesus of Nazareth? Could you assume that? Well, in a sense, I think you can assume that, especially from this Lord's Prayer in John 17. Now, this is what I call the Lord's Prayer, what Jesus prays in Matthew is a disciple's prayer, teaching his disciples how to pray. But this is the Lord's prayer himself. And the Christ that prayed this prayer, I think, through Jesus of Nazareth, is the same Christ that's in us. That same Christ spirit is in us that was in Jesus of Nazareth and made him uh, Jesus Christ. That same Christ is in us. And I want you to, I want you to read this in this, in this sense. Uh, the Holy Spirit would like to introduce you in prayer to the spirit of giving. I'm not talking about money. Uh, the least of the giving is money. But I'd like you to see by the Christ that is in you, he's a giver. God is a giver. And when Christ comes into us, he becomes a giver. If we're not careful, our praying will always be getting prayers. Getting prayers. I'm going to get this. I'm going to believe God and get this. But the a greater spirit of praying is in giving. Uh, for instance, let me ask you to mark something in your Bible. We won't take time to read this whole chapter, but you need to, you need to mark this very spirit of giving that's in John 17. Verse 2, he says, And as many as thou hast given him. In uh, verse 6, he says, I have manifested thy name unto men which thou gavest me. Out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them me. And then in verse 8, he said, I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received it. Verse 9, he says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for thine they are thine. And then in verse 12, he says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. 
You can see from the frequent use of these terms, give and given, and gavest and gave, that the whole interest is in being a giver. God, you've been a giver. I'm going to give her back to you. And what really is in, is in, uh, in the uh, center of this prayer is the fact that Christ saw that God took the souls that were in the world and he gave them to Jesus. Now, you, you have to understand something, that Jesus Christ, God the Son, received nothing in benefit from coming to this earth. What could he possibly be benefited for, for coming to this earth? But he knew one thing. He knew that the creature that God had created was created by God to bring him honor and glory, bring God honor and glory. So the only thing that really mattered in the whole of the world was these that God had created to bring him honor and glory. If Jesus could come down to this earth and save some of them by what he did, then it would be worthwhile. So there would be nothing else on this earth for the God Son to get, no place to go. That's why he never went 30 miles or, what was it, 100 miles from his, from his birthplace. There was no place to travel, no, nothing, <coughs> nothing to see, no tour to take. Uh, uh, there wasn't anything on this earth for him except those souls that God had created to bring him honor and glory. So when Jesus came down here, it was fixed so that he could die and save those souls. He took those souls from the grasp of the devil and saved them from Satan. So the prayer was, Father, those that were yours, you gave to me. You created humanity to bring you honor and glory, and then you gloriously turned around and gave some of them to me that I could save them that I could die for them. But he said, I don't want to keep them. Those that you've given me are really yours, and I'm going to return them back to you. Spirit of giving. God gave to him as his only reward, and Christ returned it back to the Father. Now that's what's behind this prayer. So Jesus is praying here for something very important. He's praying that those that the Father has given him might not be wasted from his ministry, but that from his ministry they would gain something very important, and that was oneness with him, as he was one with the Father. That was the rest of his prayer. First, they were thine, you gave them to me, I give them back to you. But then he said, if I've got one thing to ask concerning these, it is that they would be one with me as I'm one with you because I know that would bless you, Father. What a thing. The Holy Spirit in us renews our mind that we might have the power of praying that one prayer. What should our prayer be? Father, as you have given us the Son to be our life, we return that Son back to you through us. Christ, in me, return to the Father as me. And when the Father receives Christ as me, he has not only received himself as offspring in the form of Christ, but he has received me back in his ultimate intention in the form of honor and glory and praise. So the Holy Spirit helps us to come to the knowing of this. That's revelation knowledge. That's why we need Christ revealed in us by the Holy Spirit, because the real power of the Holy Spirit is finally bringing us back to that giving spirit. I will give Christ to the world. I used to preach a sermon on Mary 
the mother of Jesus, of how she gave a living Savior to a dying world. That's what we all are. We are givers of this Christ to a dying world just like Mary was. Well, I'm not giving him in body form of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm giving him in body form of myself. I am the container. The only difference between me and Jesus of Nazareth is that Mary manufactured his body, which was without sin. My mother manufactured the body I am where Christ has been placed, which is a body of sin. So I'll never be exactly like Jesus of Nazareth. Can't be. Don't want to be. I want to be Christ as me. Me as Christ. I want to be what God's intention for me was. But the power of the Holy Spirit is in me praying that way. Did you ever pray the prayer, Father, I want to give Jesus to the world. I want to give Jesus back to you as me. Did your love affair with the Christ in you reach that point? Have you come to that place to where your prayer is, Father, I would like for you to receive me even now in the form, human form that I am in the person of Christ? I'd like to give you Christ back in my form. Sometimes I'm led to pray, Father, you see only Christ in me. I'd like to see only Christ in me. The power of the Holy Spirit then is in this prayer of what we shall give back to God as Jesus gave the souls of men back to the Father, so we give back to God ourselves. But it goes on. The power of the Holy Spirit can be found in the death of Jesus. I want you to uh, go with me to Romans 6. The power of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life manifested through the death of Christ. This is one of the most potent things we study out of Romans 6. It's in the very first verses, like verse 3, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Verse 3 says, here's something you need to know. What is it the Holy Spirit does? Brings our knowing to a focal point. What is it we need to know about the death of Jesus? that we were baptized into his death. What does the word baptized mean? It means placed in two. So each one of us was in Christ when he died. Now we talk about this often. It seems like I talk about it uh, every session one way or another because Romans 6 is, is the very heartbeat of how to live the Christian life. But I don't think we think about that enough. I don't think we give the Holy Spirit opportunity to uh, make us aware of this like well, too. And there's great power in that. The great power is in the fact that you see that Christ's death is your death. That's the power. You died to that thing. For instance, you having a certain thing to take place. Maybe you're about to commit some sin and uh, one side of you says, well, I can't help it. This is the way I am. I've just got to do this. The Holy Spirit's power working in you will say, you died on the cross. Therefore, you are dead to this thing. So there is no such thing that this is in your human nature and this is something you have to do or this is something you'll do because you've always done it. It isn't like that at all. You're dead to it. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. He is reminding you that you're dead to that thing. How dead are you? As dead as Christ was on that cross. That's how dead you are to that thing you say, I can't overcome, I can't stop. 
Well, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will remind you that you were baptized, placed into his death, so that as dead as he was, you are now dead to sin. He goes on down a little further here and says, reckon yourself dead to sin. What does that mean? Think it. Get it fixed in your mind. What? That you're baptized into his death, therefore I am dead to this sin. You see, I want to give believers liberty. I want them to be alive and have freedom. But I won't take away the work of the Holy Spirit that's going to remind them constantly of their death with Christ and the fact that they're dead to sin. The Christ life never gives license to sin. The Christ life will tell you that Christ is there. He will not work through sin. He will not tolerate sin. And the Holy Spirit will warn you of sin. And the Holy Spirit will work at bringing judgment on you for sinning. But you see, if you knew you were dead to sin, you wouldn't go ahead and commit it. You don't have to. The only reason you'd do it is because you want to. Because you're dead to it. Is that plain enough? Every one of us in this room are dead to any sin. The only reason we'd commit it is because we want to. Oh, we could be slipped upon in depression or, or uh, tricked by Satan maybe or, or be sick and do something we shouldn't do. But those are very extraneous occasions. Generally, we know just exactly what we're doing. And if we don't want to sin, we don't have to. See, you don't have to commit a sin of the flesh. You don't have to give vent to your flesh. The only thing a believer worries about is his flesh anyhow. It's your sins of the flesh that temporarily separate you from the Christ that's in you. And you rule over those by your mind. And that's why I'm saying that the work of the Holy Spirit in your mind gives you the power over sin because he reminds you of Christ's death. Now, some people need that regularly. They need to be reminded regularly that when Christ died, they died in him. So you are now free of that sin. But let's, uh, let's move on. We also, by the Holy Spirit have our minds renewed to the power of the resurrection. Go with me to John 3, third chapter of John. And the very famous scripture in verse 36, John 3 and 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, I love this verse because I think this is really the only verse that uh, spells this out so clearly. I'm often saying it and I, I irritate people by saying it. But nobody is alive to God that has not been born again. That's a hard statement, isn't it? Because everybody feels like they're God's creature. They are created by God, but they're not alive unless they have the Son. And notice he didn't say here, he that hath the water baptism or he that's joined the church or he that believes uh, in the doctrine he says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Well, <laughs> that kind of puts us in a cage all by ourselves, doesn't it? Because we're living in a world that's not alive to God. I've never known how far to take a statement like that. For instance, how does God hear a dead man's prayer? How does he do it? His grace is sufficient. They are dead to him for lack of the Son, but they're alive physically and soulishly, and God by the Holy Spirit listens to a sinner. 
Now this is my evidence that the Holy Spirit is with a sinner. First place they couldn't be saved if the Holy Spirit didn't convict them and draw them. But how many times you've heard of God hearing the prayer of a sinner? I don't mean for salvation, but I mean I've had numbers of them healed and they've received miracles and have been blessed by God. Uh, I'm sure God has uh, some mechanism whereby he would bless them. Uh, I figured that out one day when I used to have any number of women in a church who would bring tithes from an unbelieving husband. And I always marveled at that, that the unbelieving husband would allow uh, the woman to bring her tithe and offering to the Lord. And uh, one day I saw it clearly. That man's business was so greatly blessed and he gave God the glory for it, but wouldn't come to church and wouldn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, but he gave God the credit. He said, I give my money to God, and God gives back to me. Proof of some kind of a, a material law, you know. But he was dead to God. He was dead to God as a son, as a believer, as a saved person. He was dead to God. I guess not dead to God as a human being or an individual, but dead to God as one of God's creatures. Well, the point we want to see here is that the only way you have life is by the Son. You don't have resurrection life because you feel it. You don't have resurrection life because you've experienced it or, or have seen it. You have resurrection life because you have the Son in you and He is the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And now then that you're getting it fixed in you that the Son is in you, Christ is in you, then you have resurrection life. The power of resurrection life rules over death. Now this is one of my favorite subjects because I think Paul was very clear on it. Paul had such resurrection life working in him that he said it doesn't matter whether I live or die. He says if this earthly tabernacle is dissolved, I've got a new building. What was his source of power? How could a man live saying he didn't care about natural life? He had resurrection life working in him. Resurrection life. Well, now that's something that you get fixed in your mind because you're never going to feel that resurrection. If you, even got a, if you even got a splinter of resurrection working in you, you'd blow out of this world. Uh, so you, you're not going to feel it or see it or taste it. It's not going to come to you outwardly, but if you have the Son in you, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you that He is the resurrection and the life. Everything Christ is, you are by Christ in you. I need to sell a book at that point. You need this book, The Believer's Secret of Happiness, because the whole last section of that book deals with what Christ is you are. All the I am's of Christ. I don't know, there's about 10 or 15 of them. The I am's of Christ. And then there's a whole listing of what you are. The I am's you are by Christ in you. He said, I'm the light of the world. He said, you're the light of the world. So everything he is, you are. You're not going to manifest it like him, but the Holy Spirit's going to remind you that he is resurrection and the resurrection is in you. So you have no fear anymore, but being afraid anymore. Not being afraid anymore. I have somebody ask me every once in a while, aren't you afraid to travel on airliners? Well, I do over 100,000 miles a year on airliners, and it never enters my mind. See? Never enters my mind. You know what you got fixed in your mind is what you're going to pay for. That's what you, whatever you got in your mind is what you're going to live. So I never, I never think about it. But I know resurrection is working. The Holy Spirit is constantly able to remind me that he that is in me is a resurrection and a life, and that's who I am. That's who I am by Christ in me. Go to the, go to the 10th chapter of John. In the 10th chapter of John, Uh, look at the 10th verse. John 10 and 10, you know this, this verse. The thief cometh not but to, for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life 
and that you might have it more abundantly. That's, that's a, a form of the resurrection life. And then look at verse 28 in this chapter. It says that I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I give to them eternal life. One day the Holy Spirit really blessed me by talking to me about eternal life. It came like this, as if the Holy Spirit were talking to me. And he said, uh, do you believe you have eternal life? Yes, I believe it. He said, did you know that eternal life is not only eternal present, but it's eternal past? That it's not only eternal future, but to be eternal, it has to be without beginning? I said, no, I never thought of that. I said, that's what Christ is. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. In fact, he's without beginning and without end. But he's the Alpha and the Omega to this world. Did you ever think about that? You were before the world started. Now you say, what value is that? That's why I lick the devil every once in a while. He comes around thinking he's so smart, you know, he's deceived the whole world into into sin and rebellion and I look at him and I say devil you know what I was before you I was before you I have eternal life dwelling in me Christ my very life why well, scare him he thinks he's going to deceive us all because we're ignorant but you were before this world started and I use that in other ways too a lot of people have hang-ups in their mind, their memories, in their consciousness. Things they can't forget, things they think are bad that's happened to them, but they've never given vent to eternal life being in them yet. Anybody, and I have to say this in love, but anybody that still has a hang-up over the things that happened to you in your natural life before you were saved needs to reconsider. You have eternal life dwelling in you now, and that eternal life swallows up that brief period of sin you lived in before you experienced eternal life. And it has no sway and no power over you unless you give it a mind. Your past is like your flesh. Your flesh has no power unless you give it a mind. Your past has no power unless you give it a mind. People come to me, women come to me and say, well, when I was a little girl, I was abused. One came to me not long ago and said, I was raped when I was a child and I can't get it off my mind. I said, that's your problem. Your problem's in your thinking. Mm -hmm. Another woman said to me, I was abused when I was a child and it just bothers me. Oh, I don't think she'd been bothered. There wasn't so much news of it on the radio. It stimulates the mind on the television and the radio. Everybody's talking about abuse this day. And I said to her, I said, if you knew who you was, you wouldn't let that little incident, though you think it's the biggest thing in your natural life, it's a very small incident in your eternal life. And you need to change your thinking about it. See? How many of us have little things that are hanging us up? Prejudices, hates something that happened to us that becomes the crutch that we blame everything on. Well, you got eternal life in you, and your life started with Christ before there was any beginning, Christ alive. God planned for you to be his child before the foundation of the world was laid. And if you can get it in your mind, your mind is where you're fouled up. Your mind is where you're deceived. So there's nothing that's happened to you that can't be swallowed up by eternal life. That's what made Paul said, forget those things. You can't get rid of those things. They're in your mind. God's going to leave them there because they are a signpost that says, this is what I was, this is what I'm not. They're important, but you can forget them and move on. Forget them and move on. Why? You're living an eternal life now. All they can do is take body away from you. They can't ever take your soul away from you. They can never take Christ away from you. You're vibrantly alive for eternity. Well, that's some of the things the Holy Spirit 
has for us in power. We could go on further, and if we did, we'd talk about the gifts and the ministries. But I'd really rather now that you just see that the renewal of your mind will bring you a rest and a peace you've never known and had before. And that's what the Holy Spirit is there to do. Think on these things. When you search the scriptures, see these things that are yours in Christ Jesus. Well, that's enough said.